Thank you so much, Akila. Thanks to SAA and the Human Rights Archive section for inviting us. Um, obviously, this is a very stressful and uncertain time for many of us globally. So I just wanted to say it's a real comfort to be able to be together with all of you online right now to share in your company and to be in solidarity with all of you um, for us to be present in this time and space um, together with you. And I just want to say we really appreciate um, all of you for taking the time and mental energy to be part of this today. And we're really glad um, that you're here. Um, so just before we begin, I just wanted to mention that in terms of our title, we debated whether or not to use this term, um, citizen witnesses. Um, it, on one hand, it's a shorthand that's really easy for people to understand and grasp, um, but obviously the term citizen is quite loaded. Um, and we didn't come up with a good alternative in time for this webinar, but I just want to be clear that when we say citizen, we mean it in the sense of members of a society who are connected and responsible um, to one another um, and not in terms of any nationality or um, status. Um, so we take the term citizen witnesses um, to mean ordinary people in a society who find themselves in a situation where there's an injustice or a crisis taking place. They choose very bravely to take out their phones and record what's happening and to share that information with their community or with the whole world. Um, while citizen witnessing isn't new, it's grown exponentially um, through the proliferation of cell phone cameras, you know, beginning in the early 2000s and with the emergence of social media networks. Um, citizen witnesses have brought previously overlooked human rights abuses to light and exposed them to the world. So in Syria, for example, um, citizen witnesses shaped our global understanding of the conflict at a time when international media and journalists weren't able to access the country. Um, the Syrian war is probably the most documented war in history and is often called the YouTube war because of the over 1 million videos that have been uploaded there. So in this webinar, um, we're going to discuss the relevance of citizen witnessing to archives and archivists and what role archives and archivists can play in helping this at-risk documentation serve as information and evidence in prosecuting human rights crimes, pursuing justice and accountability, and in understanding the past. But let us first begin by introducing ourselves. Um, so my name is Yvonne Ng. I'm the manager of the Archives Program at WITNESS, which is a human rights organization that supports people to use video to protect and defend human rights. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about WITNESS um, in a moment. Um, I manage WITNESS's video archives, and I support our programs and partners on archiving related projects. And I'm based in Prague in the Czech Republic. Hello, everyone. I'm Prakash. Um, Senior Manager of Programs for Asia and the Pacific. Uh, I mainly work in the region with activists, filmmakers, journalists, NGOs, and other communities who are using video and technology for human rights. Currently, I'm based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Um, so we'll begin um, our webinar by just telling you a little bit more about WITNESS and our work um, with examples of a couple of recent projects that are related to archives. Um, then we'll just highlight um, a few emerging trends and threats um, that we're seeing in the global human rights landscape. Um, then we'll take a deeper dive into Prakash's region, Asia and the Pacific, where we'll hear about some um, case studies and examples of our learnings there. And then finally, we'll close with some thoughts on the role of our video archives and archivists um, in this space, um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts and questions as well. Um, so about WITNESS, um, you know, people everywhere are turning to video to document and tell stories of human rights abuse. Um, but very often, um, people aren't filming safely or effectively, and their videos remain unseen and don't have as much impact as they could. So this is where WITNESS fits in. Our mission is to help people use video and technology safely, effectively, and ethically to protect and defend human rights. Um, we currently have programs in six regions, um, so that would be the U.S., Latin America and the Caribbean, um, Brazil, Middle East, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Asia and in the Pacific, which we'll be hearing about, more about from Prakash. Um, so what is it that we do on a day-to-day -day level? 
Um, well, we regularly conduct in-person trainings and workshops on the use of video for human rights. Um, we share knowledge and skills through written guides and tip sheets. Um, we build or contribute to tools and technologies to support people to use video safely and effectively. We also partner with grassroots organizations and activists to support their advocacy goals, usually through multi-year um, relationships with our partners. We help connect our partners with other allies and with accountability mechanisms and institutions, and we help bring international attention to their underreported stories. We also advocate for tech policies and directly to tech companies on issues that impact human rights and recommend system level changes to ensure that people can safely access the tools and technologies that they need to document human rights. And finally, um, we listen and anticipate for new threats and opportunities in the human rights video space so that we can be um, better prepared in the future. Um, so it might, I thought it might be more clear to sort of talk about, illustrate um, what we do through some specific um, examples. Um, so if you see the photo on the top left, um, this photo comes from a training we did um, late last September with youth organizers in uh, Vila Amazonas in Para, um, in the Amazon forest in Brazil, um, who are fighting to protect their land and way of life against um, mining and other um, extractive projects by large companies. So during this three-day training, my colleagues, Victor and Diane, who you can see in the center, um, from our Brazil program facilitated hands-on workshops and meetings on using video and social media for land defense. Um, this is just one of a number of trainings we've held with indigenous land defenders in the Amazon to support their really brave and incredibly um, challenging work. Then on the top right is just a still from a video that's part of an online resource that our US program just published last month on using video for legal advocacy. Um, the video features a lawyer from the CUNY Law Defenders Clinic, whom we've been working with to develop strategies for helping clients tell their stories through video. Um, as you might know, the US incarcerates more people than any other country in the world, and this disproportionately impacts low-income people and people of color. So this resource, this legal advocacy resource, is aimed at activists, uh, sorry, advocates, lawyers, and incarcerated individuals who are interested in using video for sentence mitigation and to advocate for decarceration through clemency and parole. Um, on the bottom left, uh, that's a photo from a consultative workshop that we did through our Emerging Threats program um, last December in the, at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Um, it's part of a series of consultations and workshops on deep fakes and synthetic media that we're conducting globally so that we can better understand that threat and the concerns and, um, and how human rights defenders can prepare for that. Um, so for example, one takeaway from the South Africa workshop was that there was much greater concern there over the use of deep fakes to incite violence and its potential use by the military or police to cover um, state violence against individuals you know, versus what we hear a lot in the US in terms of like its use for political misinformation or like international sub subterfuge by foreign actors. Um, so we're collecting and sharing these learnings publicly and using them to inform our policy recommendations to platforms and to legislators. And then finally on the bottom right, um, this is a uh, still from a video op-ed that our tech and advocacy program co-produced with Syrian Archive and the New York Times about our work to advocate to YouTube and Facebook about their content detection and moderation systems, um, which have mistakenly flagged and removed thousands of citizen witness videos recording evidence of war crimes. Um, and we've supported Syrian Archive in their advocacy efforts to Google to reinstate thousands of videos. The Witnesses Archives program. So alongside all of this work, Archives is one of the cross-regional programs at Witness. Um, the Archives program supports our regional programs and partners directly on projects when they concern collecting, archiving, preservation, metadata, and media management, and other similar topics, um, whether or not the partner is building a quote-unquote archive or not. Um, we then use the knowledge that we learn through our archiving collaborations to create and share accessible guidance with wider audiences. 
Um, we also try to provide a unique perspective on human rights and archives among our peers and wider audiences. And finally, we also maintain Witness's own media archive, and I'll go um, into a little bit more detail about each of these next. The collaborations, and so in, in terms of regional collaborations, one of the partners that we're currently working on through our US program is with Berkeley Cop Watch, um, which is an organization that began in 1990 as a response to gentrification and anti-homeless bigotry in Berkeley, California. And that has since developed a, a community-centered approach for gathering and curating data about policing practices from neighborhood residents and volunteers. Berkeley Cop Watch aims to reduce police violence by observing and documenting incidents, by providing direct support to victims of police violence, by strengthening their community's ability to resist police abuse through trainings, workshops, information sharing, and other community-led initiatives, um, by exploring and encouraging alternatives to people calling the police, and advocating um, for the right to observe the police. So we've been working with Berkeley Cop Watch for the past two years um, to help them streamline their video archiving workflows and to build a database for tracking police misconduct. Um, their goal is to make documentation and information that they're collecting from their volunteers and community more findable and useful for legal cases, media requests, academic inquiries, and to be able to affirm and refute official claims in the advocacy work they do in their fight for accountability. Um, so we started with a database that they had built with the Center for Third World Organizing in 1993 and worked with Berkeley Cop Watch to redesign the structure and interface of the database so that they could enter and track policing incidents along with videos, individual officers, as well as other related documentation and information. Um, we helped to develop new consistent workflows for volunteers to offload, label, and store um, the video documentation they'd collected after their shifts. Um, this process has been a very iterative one where we learn and refine what actually works um, after seeing you know, how it's going. And, but already the database has improved Berkeley Cop Watch's um, ability to retrieve their information to use in their advocacy work. Um, and we're looking forward to co-publishing the documentation and the database structure um, with Berkeley Cop Watch in the coming months and hope that it can be used and adapted by others. So this goes into our learning and sharing. Um, we regularly create outputs based on our projects and what we learn from them. So sometimes these outputs are planned from the beginning, such as the Berkeley Cop Watch database documentation. Um, however, we also try to listen um, for needs that come up in the course of doing the work um, that we might not have originally um, planned to address. So this was the case with the series that Prakash and I just recently published on the Witness blog. Um, on how to document and preserve video during internet shutdowns, um, which came out of the cross-regional work that we're doing on uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, internet shutdowns are a tactic that um, repressive regimes are increasingly turning to, especially in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Um, according to Access Now, which is doing a lot of amazing work in this area, there were 213 internet shutdowns in 2019 in 33 different countries. Shutdowns are used to stop people from organizing, from sharing information, from communicating with each other during politically unstable periods. For citizen witnesses who are doing video documentation and maintaining and preserving that documentation, shutdowns are challenging because they coincide with a heightened security environment, it's harder to send files to other people, to send files to social media, or even to your cloud backup. Um, in addition, documentation captured during shutdowns are also potentially harder for others to verify later on since it's not published right away. So this need for guidance around how to document during internet shutdowns um, came out of trainings that Prakash was doing with activists during an internet shutdown um, and you know, us realizing that no such resource already existed. Um, so uh, the resources exist as six, um, six blog posts in a series um, available in English and also in Arabic and Spanish currently with more languages um, coming soon. 
um, perspectives. So besides working on projects and creating resources, we also regularly participate in forums, such as this um, webinar today, um, to share our perspectives on archives and human rights with wider audiences, and to learn from our allies and peers, such as yourselves. And finally, um, we also maintain thousands of hours of unique human rights video footage filmed by our partners um, or documenting their work dating back to the 1990s. A lot of this video is unfortunately still on videotape, um, and trying to preserve and provide access to our collection has been challenging um, for a long time for us because, well, it's not the primary mission of our relatively small organization, and because of the cost of digitization and sustaining digital collections, as well as the security and privacy limitations. These are all challenges I'm sure um, archivists out there are all familiar with. Um, fortunately, for the past year, we've been developing a relationship with the Malmo City Archives in Sweden, um, whose rescue archives aims to provide a permanent safe haven for endangered human rights collections. Um, while the details are still being finalized, um, we hope that our video collection will be preserved and become more accessible for research and advocacy through this partnership. So before turning it over to Prakash, I just wanted to summarize some of the global trends and threats that we're seeing in our work that are relevant to archives and archivists. Um, and you'll notice I've touched upon some of these already in the presentation, and Prakash will also touch upon these um, when he talks about his work in, in his region. So first, as we've discussed, um, the growth in mobile phone ownership, in mobile connectivity, social networks, video technologies has led to an explosion of visual documentation. You might be aware of that stat that 400 hours of videos are uploaded to YouTube every minute. Um, in addition to citizen witness videos, other types of visual documentation, such as high quality satellite imagery, are also being increasingly used in human rights investigations. Um, so for archivists, the question is, how does this kind of, this huge volume of visual documentation impact how we should approach our work? Um, second trend we're seeing um, is that journalists, investigators, and courts are increasingly relying on quote-unquote open source information or information gathered from public published sources, such as YouTube and Facebook, to use as evidence of human rights crimes. So this image on the right, for example, comes from a Facebook video that was used to obtain an arrest warrant at the International Criminal Court. Um, so it's uh, the photo is of, or the, the video still is from, of um, Mahmoud Mustafa uh, Busef al Warfali, who's a commander of the Al Saika Brigade in Libya, and as he's executing an unidentified um, person in a hood. Um, it was used as evidence, along with six other videos, in the arrest warrant for Warfali, um, who's accused of committing or ordering 33 murders in Benghazi um, between 2016 and 17. It represented the first time the ICC issued an arrest warrant based on social media evidence. Um, so I guess the question for archivists is, you know, do the, do the current methods that we use in archives for collecting, describing, and demonstrating the authenticity of open source content such as this meet the needs for these kinds of new kinds of uses? And then thirdly, you know, along with more visual documentation, it's increasing use as evidence, there's also a growing recognition of the sort of precarity of this kind of information and the challenges of finding, identifying, and authenticating it. Um, many activist networks and collectives or organizations are taking up this challenge by building their own collections or archives and workflows for managing them, as Prakash is going to share some examples of. Um, so I think the question for archivists is how does this impact um, how we think about archives and where um, they're situated? Um, turning to threats, um, one that I mentioned in, already in a previous example, is um, content moderation on social media platforms. Um, in an effort to eradicate terrorist and violent extremist content, governments and platforms are implementing overbroad removal policies and practices that have inadvertently also swept up content, such as evidence of war crimes, and even content that's critical of terrorist viewpoints because the automated tools don't adequately understand context. 
Um, this has happened, for example, with thousands of videos from Syria, Yemen, and Ukraine. So, you know, for, for archivists, uh, the question is, what is the historical impact when artificial intelligence can flag and remove thousands of videos from these platforms, often before that content has been seen by a single human viewer? Um, another threat, which I've already mentioned, is internet shutdowns, but that it is an ever-growing global concern. Um, you know, whose voices and stories are getting systematically blocked from getting out and thereby never archived and preserved. And finally, um, the spread of misinformation and disinformation, um, whether it takes the form of deep fakes or synthetic media, or as I mentioned earlier, or I don't know, shallower forms um, of intentionally or unintentionally misleading or fabricated content is another threat. Um, there are all kinds of repercussions of misinformation and disinformation, including you know, harming free and fair elections, inciting discrimination, hatred, or violence against particular groups. Um, so do archives and archivists have a role in building awareness and literacy around um, these new forms of information? So I'm going to hand it over to um, Prakash right now to tell us a bit more about his, the work in his region. Right, thanks, Yvonne. Um, let me start sharing some of my experience and learning from the ground, especially working with various activists, organization, and citizen witnesses um, in the region. So th this picture actually is a screen grab uh, from a video. Uh, will be shared shortly, the web link. You can watch it later. Uh, it's from uh, the Rakhine State, Myanmar, uh, late 2000. Uh, 17 August, a deadly crackdown by Myanmar army on Rohingya Muslim sent hundreds of thousands fleeing across the border into Bangladesh. Uh, many of you may, might already heard about this uh, Rohingya crisis and genocide. Um, so during that, that period, uh, many Rohingya villages uh, started filming what happened to them, uh, also while they are fleeing, fleeing to Bangladesh. And hundreds of these videos uh, shared through their uh, network. I mean, ex especially people who are living outside Myanmar, um, the refugee communities, uh, they shared through uh, WhatsApp groups uh, and later being uploaded by the trusted activists, Rohingya activists, uh, uh, through social media like Facebook, Twitter, and other uh, platforms. So um, from war crimes to other human rights violations, uh, people continuing to film using, using their smartphone and uh, sharing their content. Um, you can see it's, uh, it's happening uh, everywhere in the world. So I'm going to like uh, talk about some workflow uh, like we are seeing on the ground, uh, especially uh, how this, um, videos being ended up on, on social media platforms. Okay, so um, as you can see, the user, anyone who are filming using mobile phone, either it can be protests or any human rights violations, uh, they are sharing um, the content, the media content, especially videos and photos, directly into their uh, personal uh, Facebook, uh, like Twitter and so on. And also, they also share through a uh, messaging app like uh, WhatsApp, uh, Telegram, and so on, uh, through their close groups, private groups, and also other uh, public groups. And of course, the, the, the methods can be very similar. Either they're sharing it um, online or offline through like phone-to-phone -phone transfer, or like they transfer their videos through hard disks and so on. So. Most of the time, we have been hearing uh, these videos um, being shared mainly through chat apps, not necessarily uh, directly through the platforms. Okay, then later on uploaded to this platform for another reason because um, the, the bandwidth and the internet connectivity not so good in some part of the region. So that's how they try to uh, use this chat app to send the media quickly. 
But you know, there's another risk when they share through WhatsApp or in other apps. If you don't uh, save it on your phone, mobile phone is, is going to disappear from the server. So there is more challenges on that unless you are consistently archiving whatever content you are receiving through these chat apps, especially saving into your mobile phone gallery. So uh, there is a greater danger of this content being taken down, like as you want already explained from uh, various platforms. And the last part I would say, like th there are some uh, community initiative, independent initiative to preserve these social media uh, videos, especially, uh, and to archive it uh, using day-to-day uh, -day, uh, platforms uh, and tools are available. So um, what does preservation mean? Why we need to preserve, especially I said uh, the human rights video can be lost due to various reasons. Um, preserving the video or the media means uh, it exists over time, it is reachable, available to intended users. It can be anyone, investigators, if someone seeking for justice or advocacy purposes, it can be identified, it can be open and played. Uh, the format when they download uh, is, is playable and so on. It can be understood and interpreted. And this is based on the context, uh, how the video been filmed or like how long is the duration and so on. And definitely there's a possibility to authenticate the, the video. Then um, for the human rights content, uh, we can see more greater challenges, especially from the authorities, try to hide or deny the access or created by the communities with few resources for archive. Um, and also safety security issues. Uh, you can see in the countries like even uh, they have no right to, although they have right to film, but of course they can't do it and they are risking their life, especially when they are taking out the mobile phone and start filming. Um, Sometimes uh, citizen short videos, uh, it's difficult to <coughs> identify. There's no less context or metadata in it, so you need to contextualize. And, and another issue is like chain of custody. Once you start uploading this content uh, online, uh, sometimes you don't know who shot the video from where it came from, especially through the uh, messaging app, like it's forwarded multiple times and there's no, not enough or sufficient metadata. And also another main issue, like once you upload these videos or media into any platform, the, the, meta, the original metadata is scrapped. Um, that's another issue. And I just want to give uh, one example of the content like takedown, like as uh, Yuan already explained, uh, this is Shah Hussein, a prominent Rohingya activist living in Saudi Arabia. He was running a channel called Araka News Agencies with like 60,000 subscribers. And it was deleted by YouTube uh, during that uh, conflict period. But of course, later was reinstated. And uh, similarly, many other Rohingya activists had uh, faced similar uh, challenges, especially their social media account being um, blocked or like the page being taken down, especially Facebook pages during the Rohingya crisis or genocide. So th these are real uh, examples that how this can be challenging. Um, now I'm going to share some of the regional archiving initiative that uses day-to-day -to -day tools and platforms to preserve and archive important human rights videos for advocacy, justice and uh, accountability purposes. So I, as you can see in this uh, slide, it's a screen grab of videos that collected by Rohingya Genocide Archive. Um, uh, one of our partner is an independent initiative by Rohingya media and activists that are currently systematically uh, collecting visual media evidence of genocidal crimes and crimes against humanity that perpetrated against the Rohingya with the hope uh, that these videos can be used for investigations and uh, bring the perpetrators to, to justice. Here another example, uh, 
it's a public archive uh, initiative by Groundview uh, during the Candy riot. It's like 2018 anti-Muslim uh, riot in Sri Lanka. So they use Google spreadsheet to archive the videos with metadata. Uh, I, I heard later it was used by many people for verification, reporting, and for evident purposes, even by the authorities. Here another uh, example from the popular decentralized Hong Kong protest movement, uh, known for using unique techniques for communication and uh, organizing. Uh, they used like uh, telegram channels and groups to communicate and share photos and videos. Uh, they, they share files and, and other media through AirDrop also, uh, iPhone to iPhone. Uh, they also like crowdsource uh, and preserve police brutality videos, uh, similarly using uh, Google Drive and uh, spreadsheet, uh, so the public can access uh, these drives and folders. But again, I'm just like to remind the, the challenge of uh, Telegram channels and group. There's a massive uh, subscribers, sometimes few thousand, and tons of videos being shared and. If you don't have a proper uh, workflow, and um, then it's, it's difficult. But it, it depends on the collections um, and the purpose of this, this public archive. What is their intention? Uh, sometimes it's mainly to preserve it quickly before uh, take down or like even the user delete the video. So sometimes um, for them, uh, they, they don't really look into the security matters and other privacy issues because for them, this video is in the public domain. We're just preserving it. Okay. Then uh, lastly, uh, I'd like to share another initiative. Uh, this is from West Papua by filmmakers and activists. Um, this platform mainly created using an open source tool called Shahidi and it's customized. And you can geotag the videos, the location, uh, and so on. Uh, in, in the intention to create, uh, like to promote peace and human rights in Papua by focusing on justice and accountability of the authorities. As you know, there, there's an ongoing uh, conflict in West Papua, and also uh, last year well, there was a huge uh, protest movement uh, against like di uh, not discrimination. And grassroots activists, filmmakers, and uh, journalists uh, are feeding videos and information to this online web platform that serves as a public archive, online archive, with the hope to share trusted and verifiable videos uh, for journalists, international NGOs, UN agencies, and other justice and uh, accountability uh, mechanism. Yeah. Uh, so far, uh, I think that that's my sharing. Uh, please uh, feel free to ask questions later. Uh, now I'd like to pass it on to Yuan to conclude. Thank you. Thanks, Prakash. So just before we uh, stop talking and we open up for discussion and Q&A, I just wanted to um, summarize um, sort of what we've been talking about and why archives and archiving are so relevant to um, citizen witness videos. Um, you know, it's relevant because we want citizen witness videos to be used um, most effectively as sources of information and evidence by activists, journalists, investigators, researchers, or lawyers in the defense and protection of human rights. And for that, videos need to be preserved. Um, you know, meaning that the videos need to persist and remain available. They need to be playable, identifiable, understandable, and authentic authenticatable, as Prakash mentioned. These archival values align with what information needs in order to be usable by the other users in other realms, such as in, for journalism, um, you know, where they're interested in provenance, source, date, location, and motivation, and in, the, in a courtroom where they're interested in authenticity, reliability, um, probative value, um, and chain of custody. So, you know, at a time when there is more and more visual documentation, when open source content is increasingly being relied upon as evidence of human rights crime, 
and human rights crimes. And when we're facing the threats of mass content removals, internet shutdowns, and misinformation and disinformation, there is a lot of value in human rights archives, archivist, and archival methods. Um, so just to close, we wanted to summarize some um, practical um, ideas of what we think archives and archivists can do. And we'd also just love to hear from you as well. Um, so just to throw them out there, um, it's very useful to have accessible and simplified guidance on techniques and workflows. I mean, we saw some of the examples that Prakash shared. People are using you know, Google Drive and accessible tools. Um, and, and, and need similarly accessible techniques and workflows. So as I mentioned just now, tools that are free and transparent, um, methodologies that are appropriate for environments where people you know, have no budget and you know, very low resources, you know, possibly limited bandwidth. Um, it's also very useful um, for you know, archivists to offer their time their labor and their expertise within their own communities or communities that they're part of, um, offering services or safe havens for endangered collections. Um, and finally, um, you know, these community initiatives are very difficult to sustain and to find that they, they often have a lot of difficulty finding um, money. So, um, and you know, the existing grants are not really um, aimed at these kinds of uh, of initiatives, so any resources and funding for, for these community-based archives is also very useful. So with that, I'm going to throw it over to Itza, and uh, we'll have, we have some time for a Q&A. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to Yvonne and Prakash. Uh, as Yvonne mentioned, my name is Itza Garbahal. I am one of the co-chairs uh, for the SAA Human Rights Archive section. Um, and so we will be transitioning to the Q&A portion right now. Um, feel free to start dropping in those questions. Um, there should be a little small window on your screen. Um, also, we invite any sort of like personal questions that you don't want us to uh, verbally say out. Um, just give us some sort of like signal, like say, you know, just between us or something like that. Um, and so to give Prakash and Ivana second to catch their breath. Um, I just wanted to mention that this year is actually the 10th anniversary of the Human Rights Archive section of SAA. And while lots of things are happening right now, um, we are hoping to have some sort of celebration, whether that's at SAA annual or in some other way. Uh, so just stay tuned. Also, there is a question about whether this recording will be made available and yes it will be made available for free um, you do have to create an account to be able to access a lot of the videos through the SA education portal um, but you can catch this video as well as a video from our 2019 uh, recording around Native American boarding school records um, in which we worked with the Native American boarding school healing coalition uh, so please check those out and so now I will sort of play questionnaire, um, pulling from the Q&As, um, and I will start with the first one. So this is, uh, I think Yvonne, you can speak to this. Regarding the Berkeley Cop Watch, what is the recommended method for those recording the videos for transferring the content to the archives, whether that's physically or online? Um, well, in terms of the Berkeley Copwatch workflow, so we're working, um, you know, with their own volunteers who are using Berkeley Copwatch cameras. So the workflow for that, you know, involves them, you know, physically being in the office and, you know, offloading the the original video files like off the camera and into their storage. Um, and you know, we we just kind of worked at like what um, you know what software they would use to like just get the stuff off the camera and then. Um, a filing, basically a filing system for so that everybody is putting their videos from their shift into like a consistently named folder in you know one spot. They're they're basically their archival storage, um, you know, which is you know backed up on a regular basis. You know, so before what was happening was like, you know, there wasn't like a protocol for getting the the videos off the camera after the shift. So sometimes there would be a camera that somebody's using, you know, at some point, and there's like a two month old video file still on the camera, and nobody knows whether it's been offloaded. Nobody knows like which shift it came from. 
So it's just like kind of, um, it's nothing really complicated. It's just um, doing like regular, making something like consistent and, and easy, like a very like basic, like this is like you plug in the camera and this is how you file it. This is how you name the folder. Um, but I mean, if you're asking in terms of like, you, if you're a community member, if you're in Berkeley, I don't know, um, Zachary, if you are, but um, there, you know, Berkeley Cop Watch does, will um, also accept, um, you know, videos and documentation from the community. So um, I would recommend getting in touch with them directly and you can, you know, arrange a time to like either, I guess not maybe go there physically now, but, um, you know, to email it or send um, send the files over. And if you have, like, if you can send the original files, that, that would, that's the ideal. Perfect. So there's another question um, regarding Google. Uh, is that Google platform, meaning like the Google Drive platform, um, a safe way to uh, store files, share files? Um, yeah, if you, Yvonne or Prakash could speak also to any sort of maybe additional safety measures that y'all use, um, that would be really helpful. Yeah, I can start with like, it, it depends on their objective and why you preserving this collection or like these videos. And of course, uh, on a lot of other uh, like war crimes and other sensitive uh, documentation, like you want to look at uh, like digital security, not only digital, also physical, because people who are doing this work also at risk. So there, there are many uh, uh, like examples I shared earlier. Some of it is public, some of it is not public. So like example, uh, like the Rohingya genocide archive initiative is, is not public yet. It, it's just uh, people who are like preserving and collecting this, but it's not anywhere on the internet. So I would say it depends on the purpose of the collection and also taking into con consideration not only digital security, also physical security as a, like we call it like holistic security and uh, on certain contexts and uh, situations. So of course, <laughs> the, the, the popular platforms, uh, not all have a proper encryption and also uh, privacy. So it, it depends on the purpose again. So I would say like um, if you having like sensitive collections, like of course, uh, encryption comes first and not only for the collection and also but for the communication also and all other uh, things related uh, to that preservation. Yeah, I guess I would also just add, you know, some it just depends on what like the, the, the threats are as Prakash mentioned. So in some cases, you know, the, 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 the people like having that information public would put people at risk you know, in other situations, the risk might be that the content is will disappear. Like it's already you know online and public, so it's not that there's no security in terms of like people seeing it. But the risk is that it's going to get taken down um, and it'll be lost forever. So in in those kind of cases, sometimes just like saving it like before like as quickly as possible is, is the right approach. You know, so it, it depends um, on the situation. I think. Okay. So next question. Um, so things are changing every day. Uh, how do you two anticipate the work of witness um, adjusting to the current uh, COVID-19 outbreak since so much of the work is dependent on travel to do training? <laughs> this is also affecting my work. Um, so I'm very curious to hear your thoughts. Um. I want to hear what Prakash has to say, but um, one thing I can share is that my brilliant colleague Victor in Brazil yesterday, he shared with us that one thing he's doing um, is he sent a note out to all of you know the activists and people that he works with in Rio and in Brazil saying like, you know, we can't go out right now, but this is a great time for you to organize and back up your files. And if I can help you with that, so give me a call and we'll walk through it together. Because, um, you know, that's like that, you know, that's kind of the basic stuff, like the backup, the organization, getting stuff off of your phone is the stuff that nobody has time for normally. Um, and now that we have a little moment where we can't leave our houses or whatever, 
um, this is a great opportunity to do some of that. Prakash? Yeah, just like um, maybe add something quickly. It's, it's, it's really challenging times. Sometimes we get organized uh, remotely or through internet, but not necessarily most of the time because of the countries you're working in, the people you're working in with uh, no internet connectivity. So definitely it's going to be challenging. But um, like Yvonne mentioned, like most of the communication is being done through uh, a mobile phone or like uh, chat apps or like other communications that we still can communicate with the people who have internet. And of course, the sometimes we can see this also as a privilege. What about people who don't have internet? What about people who don't have home uh, to quarantine themselves? And th these are other challenges we also need to look at. So I would I would say like, let's pull resources together, start talking about these new challenges, how people get organized or community get organized, supporting each other and so on. Of course, uh, there should be more aggregated like data available for everyone globally uh, to support each other, not only country or region specific to move forward. Thank you. Uh, so another question, how can archives, archivists uh, support your work, obviously apart from signal boosting, retweeting, every single thing that all of the witness channels uh, say, um, whether that's, you know, specific to like a particular I mean, project or just like in general, how can we help slide. you? I think those are the ways. I mean, it doesn't like, you know, I mean, doing like doing work in the, you know, the communities that you're part of, I think is helpful. Like if you if you're creating any guidance or, you know, if you're building any tools that are free and open source and, you know, secure, like um, let us know about them and then, you know, we, if they're appropriate, we can pass them on to the people that we're working with. Um, yeah, like, the, like methodologies, tools, guidance, um, funding. <laughs> and if you're, and if you're working on projects, like I, you know, it's great for us to hear about them and learn about what you're learning. And so, cause like those learnings can translate to other people. Um, not even, not yeah, even donating absolutely to funding. Not um, donating to please like feel free to donate to Witness. Uh, I'm going to put that plug in. Uh, so next question. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Sharing the resources that you might be producing and being kind of like that uh, middle person to just bring it to them, you know. Um, so the next question. Uh, so this person works in an academic library archive um, and they want to get more involved with these sorts of like initiatives and projects, whether as a volunteer or perhaps like providing some consultation. They want to know like how and where do they do this with kind of like a bit of a caveat, like is this also like a luxury or a privilege um, for us in particular working in the United States, working internationally, um, what sort of maybe consideration should we also think about um, so that we're not just always thinking of human rights as this thing that's happening outside, but also thinking about how do we position ourselves with all of our multiple identities and privileges. I don't know, Prakash, if you want to take this, I can. That's a long question. <laughs> um. I mean, like a big part of, you know, what Prakash does, and Prakash, I don't want to speak for you, but like all of our regional program um, team is like, you know, building those relationships and building that trust and listening and he hearing what people like need as a, you know, as like that is a huge part of their job. So it's like not that, you know, we just go in and say like, we know this and you need to know this, you know, like there's, um, you know, these are kind of like, we, we spend a long time like building relationships with our partners um, and trying to support what their goals are as opposed to setting our own goals. Yeah, I would like to add like, it's part of 
especially for me personally so i'm an activist so i'm with the community uh, i know them and most of them i work with i'm in solidarity with them it is not like taking like a, a approach of like ngo going in tell, telling them what to do and so on it's not it's just part of supporting the existing initiative that people are already uh, doing it either way and also to come in with certain uh, like expertise that it's not there yet example of like archiving if people not thinking about doing it or like they they have no capacity that that's where the training and resources come in so uh, i i would say it's like not like a top uh, like uh, bot is top to bottom is like bottom to up like we we listen to them uh, like we learn from them and also to be in solidarity and share to, uh, together these learnings uh, to to support uh, existing uh, advocacies and uh, uh, the human rights issues uh, facing the region So next question. Uh, so this is about uh, video authentication um, or otherwise trying to ensure that video can be uh, considered as like valid evidence um, that it's reliable, um, in particular when being used in court um, or in transitional justice efforts. Uh, does witness uh, have or know of any guidelines to this? I think Barkesh, you might have mentioned this um we can also yeah definitely send you, you can resources like, uh, afterwards of anything that we're mentioning right now we have a lot of uh, like resources especially on uh, this a uh, guide on video as evidence uh, to support lawyers and activists uh, who are filming uh, for evidentiary purposes and also to authenticate and uh, verification so there, there's also other initiatives out there like bellingcat syrian archive they, they've been doing this for long there is uh, enough uh, resources online uh, on this um, yep um, yeah i would definitely recommend our video as evidence um, resource because there there it's not there aren't like hard and fast um, <laughs> rules and it depends on like what purpose that piece of information is being used for like what it's being shown as evidence of and at what point in an investigation or at a trial um, there's a lot of different factors, but our video's evidence guide kind of goes over that, um, like, in generally, yeah. Yeah, there is a lot of uh, also examples and case studies how these videos uh, have been used uh, in courts, especially uh, uh, in transnational justice, and especially well, one of the case studies I would recall is the, the first uh, uh, case in ICC, Thomas Lubanga, the child soldier video was uh, used and, and there's many other examples, uh, especially what you want mentioned earlier, like the Facebook video in Syria. Okay, so next question, um, I think it's a sort of related question around resources, um, in particular uh, around clarification on the rights to film police. Um, with sort of like an emphasis on like how to safely intervene as the uh, documentarian um, when you're witnessing like aggressions against like people of color, um, how to safely witness without putting also those people in additional risk. Um, and then to add to it, uh, what sort of privacy concerns or like rights to, um, I'm assuming the people that are being filmed, I don't, I don't do they totally have, as opposed to say like the police that. officers? I, you know, I know the, the rules like vary from, you know, different places. Um, you know, but generally you do have the right to film, but, um, you know, uh, I, I would, uh, Prakash, correct me if I'm wrong, but we might, I think we have some resources on that in the library.witness.org, yeah. yeah. um, particularly from our U.S. Uh, program and in, in, in the U.S. context. Um, and yeah, and I know with Berkeley Cop Watch, for instance, they do um, know your rights trainings. Like that's like a regular programming thing that they do. So um, they also have resources on that as well. Okay, so we do have a few more questions, um, and I think I'll only be able to get to one or two more. Uh, but feel free to keep putting them on here. Um, and we do have a slide 
with contact information um, for our presenters as well as witness. So feel free to reach out with that. Um, so the next question I have is, so for an archives with limited space to collect and store digital content, uh, where can you recommend um, where folks can still collect these images or videos from the community without actually overwhelming like their own internal systems? Or I'm assuming not sorry, feel I'm obligated to ingest that. those into okay, their so own archives. I think it's what they're asking is like, so if they have limited space, um, I'm uh, assuming digital storage, I mean, um, where can they then deposit stuff? I mean, you know, in some cases like it, like some kind of institutional partnership makes sense. So I mentioned, you know, our working with the city of Malmo archives in Sweden, for instance, like obviously that does not make sense in a lot of cases. Um, you know, I think it depends on what your intentions are for the collection, who's going to need to use it. Um, you know, if there's like a, an organization, an advocacy organization that has like an existing collection and they could make use of that, those materials, then it might make sense to contact them. Yeah, I, I, I would oh, say okay. like this is quite one of the real challenges, especially there's a lot of videos. Um, if, if you don't have uh, even money to buy hard disks or like, like servers or like to preserve it, then it's, it's going to be a challenge. So unless you have like other organizations or like institution can, can support uh, your work or your, your initiative, then that, that would be great. Or any kind of like fundraising to support, uh, that would be useful. But most of the, another way that, that activists think like, oh, like let us put on the cloud, like, or let us put on a Dropbox or like drive and so on. But you know, that there's also a challenge um, like when, if let's say the account been taken down, if they lose access to their email or like password and they need to have like proper backup, it's not easy to manage. And also the question of uh, bandwidth uh, to, to upload like huge collections. Imagine you have like three, four gigabyte, the you know, one video file, how, how are you going to do with like a not fast internet uh, access? So that will be challenging or like local NGOs yeah. and activists. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I would add to that just like, you know, this, this storage is not necessarily the biggest cost or challenge when it comes to a lot of these archiving projects. Um, you know, the storage often is not like a huge cost at all. It's the all, everything else. It's the collecting, as you know, Prakash mentioned, the bandwidth, the cataloging, the, you know, having somebody who has time to organize it all. Those are sort of, I would say, like much you know, bigger challenges a lot of the time. Okay, everyone, I think we're at time. Um, just wanted to say thank you to our presenters. Thank you to our audience for attending wherever you are in the world. Um, I hope you're staying safe and washing your hands. Um, and so if you have any further questions, uh, please uh, reach out to Prakash and Yvonne, Witness, um, or you can also send questions uh, no, to SAA uh, in the email that I'm about to link. Webinar.